so yeah it's it's fun having children uh you recommend it to all our listeners It's a he good says, question. "I recommend I, I recommend them taking my children, please." Yeah. Well, it's funny. There's a little bit of like, a, yeah, I recommend them be in the same situation that I am, <laughs> so I can they're the Schadenfreude, whatever that's called. So I can watch some other people suffer, but I do watch people suffer. Like, like I was saying, like on the playground, you watch the other parents, and it's just it's all suffering. You hope so. <sighs> Or else you're doing something wrong. You don't want to be the only one. Yeah, you don't sure want I'm them not. to actually love their children and have a good time. And well, no, it loving is different. Loving has nothing to do with it. <laughs> it has to do with uh, your own selfishness and uh, energy levels. Like how much energy do you have? You know, and. And most of the time, if you go to a playground, you know, you see the veteran parents who've been parents and parenting for a long time. The kids are just like hanging by their ankles from the jungle gym, about ready to crack their heads open. And the parents just on their phone, sitting down on a bench, just like flipping through Twitter or whatever social media thing, you know, that seems to be like, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. When the, the people that are really attentive, honestly, I think they're just um, the caretakers and the parents are at work or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> like the nannies and shit. Um, yeah. Forgot myself there, and I just started talking to you like normal. All right. What do you Ooh. think this is? <laughs> I don't know. I think this is the Doddler's Philosophy Podcast. Tick, 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 tick. dog cool i don't even have to introduce myself this week no you introduced us i introduced us it's even all right well people he's even snacking on the air this is a (laughs) loosey goosey week well i better be loosey goosey because i got a lot of shit to cover but i don't want to be too loosey goosey because then i'll just like drone on and Put half of the world to sleep, because half of the world listens to us. Probably we're uh, going to sleep, right? They don't want to pay attention, but we can put them to sleep. Oh, I can put them to sleep. Although, this is the exciting part, part two, biology's part two. next big leap. Um, Yeah. All right, so I have a little Sammy Harris style... Uh, you know, housekeeping thing to do. While these podcasts now always seem to start with some housekeeping, this strikes me as a troubling sign, but I don't think I can avoid it in the present case. Okay, a little housekeeping before I bring you today's today's guest. I'd like to do a little housekeeping. housekeeping. Okay, so a little housekeeping before before I introduce today's guest. Mm. Sammy Hagar, what? Yeah, Sammy Hagar. Um, He's got a podcast called Waking, Waking Sense. Sense? <laughs> Did we both do the same joke? <laughs> we sure fucking did. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, he he did it to himself. Making up sense? Yeah, something. Making up sense. 
Anyway, housekeeping. Housekeeping. This is the thing about his podcast. I've never really listened to it. I always get to this housekeeping shit, which happens in the beginning of every episode. And I'm like, God damn it. I am not one of your listeners. Just get to the fucking point. Uh, he's like, well, many of you have emailed me. And I'm just like, who would email you? All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... I do have some housekeeping because of the last one. And I know everybody is glued to their phones listening to us. Well, I think they stop. were probably taking notes about the last one and were they just like, yeah, confirming it with their professors and checking oh, up on you and for sure. I'm <laughs> I'm important enough. So I'm agnostic. I have feelings of great confidence. And I guess you could say dogmatism in a way. But I also have, like, an intellectual green man, if you will. You know, hey, what? And the green man, a green, and the, the green man sows great self doubt. Green man is a, it's like a person who tells you you can't do something. There are some green men in the cultures where they aren't this way, but. Like in some Native American cultures, they are um, kind of this sort of, yeah, you can't do that kind of, you know. Anyway, they they sow great self-doubt, in, in, and this is the idea. And I've got sort of these two intellectual spirits on my shoulders. You know, I got the great confidence one, and I got the one, you know, the blue man and the green man, blue man group. So <clears throat> my thing is just that I can't help but clarify. <laughs> and I know you're not supposed to do that. You're like, never let them see you sweat. And I'm like, well, can I show you half my body's dry and the other half is just sweating bullets. And that's kind of a, a big source of my own generative process or whatever. You know, like I'm able to maintain this strange balance uh, for myself when I'm learning and talking and doing stuff. So I always, there's always a part of me that's like, do I really know that? You know, like that kind of stuff. But anyway, I don't know how exactly this ties into the housekeeping, but it kind of does. Um, uh, so yeah, real quick. Last week, I was talking about lots of things. And I just want to address a few of them. For one, I want to say that... Uh, the Pleistocene, according to the Geological Society of America's geological time scale, I was kind of in the ballpark. And it's funny, I have a degree. If like any of the people who are my professors were listening, they'd be like, "What the fuck is wrong with you, Ryan?" And I just, I don't know. I don't memorize these things. I've known them in the past, and I forget them because other things happen. Anyway, the Pleistocene goes from about two point five eight million years ago to about 12,000 years ago, okay? So it's not the tw 2 million to 18,000, so okay, specifically. But, you know, stuff can happen, and I, I, let's just be clear. Um, and this Geological Society of America's time, time scale, geological time scale is updated uh, it, when we started this podcast, or in, somewhere in August of 2018. Okay, then... Africa. I was like, uh, oh, it's like an octopus, you know, and all these changes happening in the ecosystems of Africa, you know, where you had, you know, uh, forests and rainforests and whatnot turning into more open environments. You know, a lot of that probably had to do with the onset of some of these major climate changes because of the ice sheets in the north. That's correct, but it's also this this area of human evolution and <clears throat> ecosystem change in uh, Africa has a lot to do with the tectonic activity going on and volcanic activity going on in East Africa. And there's this, you may have seen it from space, you know, or looking at a map of Africa on the east side where there's that horn and everything. There looks like a scar running down the side of it. And this is the East African Rift Valley system. And uh, there's quite a bit of uplift. And say, like, the Serengeti is like a west sloping 
down sloping uh, plateau of sorts, you know, and so this is all also going to be part of the aridification or drying out and opening of the, uh, you know, environments uh, as well. So there's going to be some uplift there. Um, I think I fucked up precession in the orbital cycles, and I don't know why. <laughs> I just rack in my brain like I may have been thinking about obliquity and how obliquity changes uh, in its axis tilt. But precession is the, the, I was talking about the top, you know, the dreidel, whatever, um, and it's spinning. It doesn't open up and close every 23,000 years in terms of its rotation, its sort of wobble. It just goes around once every 23,000 years in the wobble quality of it. Um, I said at one point that, oh, this is, you know, I was talking about this is this uh, James Zacco's curve where it's like the 65 million year curve of climate, you know, and just sort of taking, uh, uh, all these, um, isotope data from the, uh, benthic form and uh, shells or whatever is. And, um, I never know what the fuck they're called and I haven't bothered to look it up. They're not called shells. I don't think there's something anyway, it doesn't matter. But they get these isotope data from them. And basically, I said that this kind of grazes my life and career or whatever. I used to work on the ship that did vast, probably majority of the drilling for these sediment cores. Sediments made out of organisms, shells, the dead shells of organisms. That they then went and extracted the car, uh, the oxygen isotope data from to get a proxy for temperature on the planet and the relative changes. And so anyway, I just, I used to work on the joy D's resolution and, uh, that was just a big drilling ship. I mean, big, it's relatively large. And so that's my only thing I was trying to say there. You're welcome. And then finally, evolutionary psychology. I was like, blah, 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 back in the place to see. And I was like, all right, you know, I, I know that there's a lot of controversy around that particular discipline where they're attempting to bring together like anthropology and evolutionary biology and psychology. And they're trying to say stuff about, uh, you know, just the psychology of people and how did certain psychological phenomena uh, come about. And the big thing about evolutionary psychology is that essentially their whole claim is that in our modern skulls, we have, a Pleistocene brain or something along those lines. They like to say ancestral hunter gatherers because usually they're talking to people who don't know what the word Pleistocene means. Not our audience. Not anymore. Um, <laughs> so there have been some people who have criticized them quite a bit. The person who, in my opinion, has done the greatest amount of criticism of evolutionary psychologists, uh, psychology and the psychologists, is this philosopher of science named David Buller. I think he's still at Nor Northern Illinois University. And uh, he's got all these points that he makes, and he's written books and all that kind of stuff. The main thing that, to me, anyway, seems to be the big issue uh, about this idea of evolutionary psychology is that, well... If, for some reason, you have some, like, phenomena, like, I'm sorry to say this because it's so, you know, in this day and age, controversial and all that kind of stuff, but whatever. The idea that, you know, like rape or something like that, you know, they would say, well, rape is a way for inadequate males in human culture or human groups in the Pleistocene to still find a way to spread their seed or something like that. I don't know if that's exactly what they say, but they say something along those kind of lines. And the, the issue is that, you know, rape, as we define it, we could probably take that definition and apply it throughout the animal kingdom, probably even apply it perhaps even with chimpanzees or whatnot and the idea being that well okay if it's a, if it's a phenomenon of the pleistocene or whatever it'll be very difficult to be able to say at least go and compare to other humans other human lineages because um you know we would then be able to 
kind of isolate ourselves from others. But instead, all we really have are bonobos and chimpanzees to compare ourselves to, to say, okay, well, when, when branching, this is something that is down the line in our evolution that occurred and not in Neanderthals and not in Erectus or, you know what I mean? Like, and we can't do that because they're not around. So it's one of those things that in, you know, when answering scientifically evolutionary questions, at least biologically evolutionary questions, that's the, that's a big way one goes about trying to attempt to do that. Is this unique to this bird, you know, this particular bluebird lineage, compare it to the other lineages it's closely related to, and oh, yeah, it's not found in those other ones, so this is something special to them. You know, it's just a basic methodological process that's, or um, concern or whatever that's often addressed. And, you know, we also do it in, uh, people who are in comparative psychology are often, all they have is chimpanzees and bonobos to you know work on you know and so they often anything that happened that's unique to us will you know how you can't say that erectus didn't do it if your only comparator say is chimps sorry i'm done that is kind of the only one that's ever really stuck out with me regarding evolutionary psychology there you go all right <laughs> This is one of those this is one of those ones where Harlan gets to say a lot of okay because I guess I have some kind of axe to grind. It's not really an axe to grind. I'm like making an axe. So for you, I can be like here, this is an axe called the Pleistocene. This is the first part and the second part of it. So I guess I made the handle and now I'm gonna make the head? Is that Blade? what they are? Blade? I don't know. Write us. Tell us if I'm right or wrong. <laughs> All right. Okay. So last time we did the environment. And we talked a little bit about geological time. We also talked quite a bit about ecosystems. And, of course, humans, us, Homo sapiens in particular, uh, evolved in the ecosystems in the Pleistocene. And, like, for instance, Homo sapiens is somewhere on the order of 100 and, well, maybe 200 to 300,000 years ago is, you know, when Homo sapiens started to really solidify as a lineage, let's say. When, you know, traits in fossils that we find, um, we would attribute to ourselves are starting to uh, arise in what little fossils we do find. Uh, we start to see them, or report on them anyway. I haven't seen them. But in particular, uh, I kind of want to just sort of quickly start to, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to start, I guess, is what I mean to say. Launch into it. Launch into it. Uh, I got a sip here. Housekeeping is over. The state of human prehistory is a body of knowledge in a lot of flux. Let me first start out and just, you know, before I start addressing that particular statement about the human lineage and its students, um, there's just a quick, like, you know, let's give you a recent history of some popular ideas that have been slowly been worked out to a degree, but not really. It's hard to say. So here's one, uh, this idea that there's a single origin namely Africa, versus multiple origin. And that's, I don't have any dates for you, but that's a fairly recent issue that has been sort of, I think, resolved to an extent. But it's not perfect. There's still quite a bit of evolution that might be going on outside of Africa that could then find its way back to those lineages in Africa and be incorporated. It's, it's a hard thing to completely settle on um ever i think but people do their very very best and i think right now then uh you know an, a single origin is still the way that it goes would multiple origin literally mean that these branches or breaks or where we split apart from the common ancestor occurred in two entirely distinct populations but that later when those two met 
they were able to breed or able to semi-qualify as the same species? Yeah, I think so. How often does that happen in biology, would you say, on Earth as a whole? Not just in humans, but is is that a thing? That seems crazy to me. Like, what are the chances that these two separate branch off points when they met up would be like, Hey, I know you, you're one of me. I want to say that that's common enough. Hmm. Uh, but it, it's hard to say you have to really be good about like, well, what's enough of a distance between them. So, I mean, would you, you know what I mean? Like the distance between us and chimpanzees is probably too great. We can't reproduce, you know, but and uh, you know, and this will be covered throughout tonight. But the idea that you know, there's some between Neanderthals and this uh, and <laughs> Denisovans and uh, hum or sapiens, which I'm going to call us sapiens. Uh, you know, we all mated with each other. You know, there's that whole thing where the most people can have is like four percent Neanderthal DNA in us because some of these. Um, Fossils have still organic material in them that people have been able to extract and uh, the DNA and I think do even uh, genomes. So <clears throat> there's that. But that's just the one like history of some popular ideas thing. Mm-hmm. There's three others I want to mention real quick. Yep. There's this whole thing about anatomically modern, this transition from anatomically modern to behaviorally modern humans, um, in particular sapiens. Uh, there's this idea that there's multiple waves out of Africa by sapiens and that there's this sort of some were successful and others were not. Really, I think it, the uh, the story goes, we went, eh, we didn't like it, we came back. We went again and we really spread out and then there was even another wave behind them, behind the second wave. There was a third wave you know, of people leaving as well and I don't know exactly where all of that stands but there's, oh, right now... It, it still seems like it's it's in flux from my uh, plebeian view. Um, and then there's this whole idea of the Great Leap Forward, that sometime between 70 and 50,000 years ago, everything changed. Uh, Noam Chomsky would be like, well, we got language or whatever. And that was it. And we just, you know, everything is the great cognitive revolution. But I don't know. About what a that. stupid <laughs> idea. Language has nothing to do with it. Yeah, well, that's another so true. Week. It's all about f- fingernails. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so like that's sort of, these are some ideas, but they're not, god damn, like you can't just be like, well, that's an open and closed case. In science, I get it. You know, like physics is still also kind of in trouble and stuff and not in trouble, but you know, it still has its issues things that it cannot resolve um, that people maybe thought were laid to rest or whatever. So yes, there's a provisionality in science, but in particular, paleoanthropology to me seems like it's really in, you know, flux comparatively. And I don't have any real good data. I thought about doing some stuff, but then I was like, I don't have time for this shit. Um, But it would be good to make a comparison of like, I thought textbooks would be a great way. You could come up with some way of like testing it, coming up with editions uh, and textbooks for the same textbook. You know, take some paleoanthropology type one, take, you know, or human evolution or something, and then take some climate change one, and then take, or, you know, climate science, something like that. Take physics or, you know, which of all the various disciplines, which one seems to, from one edition to the next, change the most, you know, and what are the measures that you would use to suggest there's change? Anyway. I thought that would be a great way to do it, but Jesus, that's like its own life project. You got time for that. <laughs> so I ain't got time for that. Um, but uh, my thinking is it's few. There's a few things. One is, uh, and this is what it is that gives me the sense that, hey, things are kind of in flux. A lot. So for one, I think about sample size. Like if you were to be uh, collecting data, And just say you have some, I don't know, length or something like that. First data point you get is six centimeters. The second one you get is seven centimeters. The third one you get is 20 centimeters. And you're like, then the fourth one you get or fifth or, you know, whatever. It's just kind of all over the place. 
your average, if you're taking one at each step, you know, taking like, oh, I've got two data points. What's the average between the two? And then you go, oh, I got three data points. What's the average between the three? What's the, you know, your average will like veer all over the place, you know, if it's going from six, seven, 20, and then 12, and then 59 or whatever, you know, like, so <clears throat> the stability of whatever is going on in your, uh, you know, the variability throughout the the measurements won't start to like settle down until you've got like hundreds and hundreds, if not more data points that you've measured and you'll have a sense for the variation and you'll have a sense for everything, you know? And, uh, in the beginning, you don't really know where you are. Are you on the short end or the long end? It's just, it's hard to say. And it's because you have a small sample size and it's just harder to get a handle on whatever your measurements are, the, the central tendencies, the variation, and I kind of think that's sort of what's going on with this discipline uh, as a sort of this, as a sort of next point, but also playing off of the sample size point, you know, there's this notion of soft science, you know, and in the late 20th century, mid to late 20th century, a lot of the sort of softer sciences attempted to make themselves more quantitative. People have probably heard the term like physics envy and things like that. Rather than just using your mere descriptions of things, people were actually trying to see a way to collect data on the things that they were talking about and see if they could actually do some tests, you know, hypothesis and be more like chemistry or be more like physics. So that's also maybe kind of part of it is that it's just a younger attempt to be quantitative. And so they haven't really built up this huge amount of information because in a way it's like, there was this one book called like the seven skeletons or something like that, that define that are like definitive for human evolution. And you're like seven, <laughs> like seven, you know, and it is very much the nature of the beast of, you know, paleontology is like when you, you know, you got to hope that something gets preserved and the thing has to be, you know, able to be in the right place at the right time for that to occur. So there's a little bit of that. But also the other thing that makes me kind of like, huh, is that at least since, I don't know, the eighties or whatever, but probably even before there's always, there are always these attempts to invalidate some lineage. Like one of them, you know, like invalidating homo habilis or, as a, you know, like nomen dubium or whatever, just like a dubious thing, uh, or homo erectus and heidelbergensis and whatnot. It almost seems as like nearly all lineages have had targets on their backs, you know, like this isn't real, you know, like, or whatever, this is just a, this, or, you know, or we don't really know what it is. And these pieces, you can't put them all together into one lineage. So there's a lot of that going on as well. And so any new piece of information that comes in can completely throw the discipline like in one direction or another it seems and so all these things like single origin versus multiple origin anatomically to behaviorally modern you know humans that transition or the waves out of africa great leap forward there's a lot more happening now in terms of what people are understanding about asia and human evolution than ever before and that's starting to change how we look at what the stories we were telling before about you know the the, you know, the state of the discipline and what we understood about human evolution with respect to, you know, looking at fossils and whatnot. So <clears throat> there's, there's all of that. So I just wanted to kind of quickly kind of clear the, clear the room. <laughs> so in other uh, words, I don't know that if, was just a long disclaimer to say that anything that is said tonight, you know, probably... Well, I'm mistaken. It's a young science. There's a lot of controversy, but I'm going to just tell you where things are right now, as far as you know. Perfect. Yes, exactly. So before one goes into all this stuff, many of these are pathways that I have taken myself and things that to me made more sense than other explanations or whatever that I've looked into. I am not obviously somebody who's got all these years of anthropology education in my background and I've never done a thesis and never had to like look my archaeology professor in the eye and you know whatever. But I have a license to learn and do this kind of research and I have my own purposes that it has served for better or worse. 
And so, uh, yeah, we're about to embark on human evolution stuff. Are you ready? Uh, I'm ready. <sighs> All right. Okay, so we're going to start talking about the things people focus on with respect to early human and, you know, human ancestor evolution. So there's, um, there's, we have like Australopithecine ancestors. It's the Southern ape is kind of the translation of that. And, you know, if Australopithecines were still alive, we'd have them in zoos. Okay, so like that's kind of as far back as this goes. Meaning that that you predict that most of us would think they're distinct enough from humans that they would be cageable and interesting to look at, but they wouldn't have moral status. And blah, blah. I would, yeah. I mean, they would have no more moral status that we would give them than we do with uh, chimps or bonobos. I guess. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <clears throat> We'd still feel comfortable keeping them in cages, mm -hmm. I guess. That's my guess. That's what I would think. Uh, so they were very ape-like, but they also, they would be like a, we, you know, a kid would say, that's a chimpanzee that walks around a lot, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they still had quite a bit of upright posture and they walked around. So it would be strange for us because it's rare to see another organism just walk around i don't know if you've ever seen any of those youtube videos of like there's some bears that just have a tendency to do some walking mm -hmm. <laughs> there's videos of like black bears just like do to do, do. <laughs> you know it's just like okay um it's a little bizarre when it's not a human being it's it's like a almost that sort of uncanny valley style like ah, you know it's hard to say what australopithecines did to make themselves into the humans that we know and love or whatever. But the next step was um, into the Homo genus, you know, uh, Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, all those kinds. So the Australopiths are our relatives. But I think the place where I would want to start, mo uh, qu well, no. Let me do this this way. That's right. I'm like, no, Ryan. So I'm going to start, I guess, with just talking briefly about who is who, the who's who, of, and I, w I won't spend a ton of time, but who's who of, you know, human evolution. Similarly, like I was talking about at the beginning of this little stretch, there's some disclaimers, but only in that it's, I want to quickly talk about ways that we've thought about these things. So for a while, so the, the, the general slotting in time of these uh, uh, lineages is that you have Homo habilis first, then Homo erectus, and then at least Homo sapiens and, you know, Neanderthals and Heidelbergs. And anyway, that'd be Homo heidelbergensis. There are various others, Homo ergaster, there's this new one called Homo naledi. Uh, there's Homo floresiensis, which is the little hobbit on the island of Flores in the Southeast Asian islands there, you know, by Borneo and stuff. And these are examples of candidate species, right? Branching off yeah, from the yeah. troglodyte or whatever lineage that we came, branch that we came off of. Yep. So, um, Back in the 20th century, early 20th, I don't know. The you know paleoanthropologists kind of thought just because they hadn't they hadn't really incorporated you know paleontology's changes into their own way of thinking. I think they were still very much like, eh, well, this is kind of the Darwinian view or whatever. That it was just a transformation from habilines to erectines to sapiens. Like it just went boom, 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 you know, like dominoes. And it's, uh, you know, that's something called anagenesis. But now it looks a lot more branchy, you know, with overlapping lineage durations. So it's cladogenesis. Um, and so, you know, habilines and erectines were living at the same time. Even erectines and sapiens looked like they were living at the same time. And of course, Neanderthals, 
I think Heidelberg's, you know, Heidelbergensis, and then maybe these Denisovins, and well, of course, yeah, these Denisovins and uh, Floresiensis, even some of the Australopithecines were, and there were a couple of other different genuses in that group. And so, you know, this is very branchy, but now we have studied their genes, uh, Neanderthals and Denisovins, and it's starting to look like there's a little bit more of like a, like we've talked about at the start, people, you know, uh, people's populations coming together from these various lineages that at some point have branched and now they're anastomosing together and getting something out of each other. So it's now hard to say like, well, what is a fucking sapiens? If we've got Neanderthal in us, like, yeah, like it's, it's not this perfect isolating thing. There's some interbreeding happening. And, um, so that's kind of the overall sort of picture. Things are changing quite a bit. A lot of that, of course, has to do with the technology, the technological changes that have come about, which allow people to answer questions they couldn't before and likely wouldn't have been even asking because they were listening to the old guard saying, yes, it went from here to here to here, damn it, you know, whatever. So there's some of that. Oh, crap, the present but is it, changing the past. Nice. So... I guess then the, the biggest part of a lot of this, you know, there's only so many fossils and there's only so many people who all, of course, want to study them and get like, I'm the one who did, you know, whatever. So the other thing that people tend to study is kind of like, you know, stone tools and they study, you know, modern humans and, the rela- and, and chimpanzees and they kind of do comparative studies. A lot of psychologists do a lot of comparative psychology type stuff. So I'm going to talk about th- some of that. I'm going to talk about stone tools. I'm going to talk about fire. I'm going to talk about language. Well, it's about time. <laughs> All right. So stone tools, who made them? <laughs> that's the big question. It's not the big question. It's the one that's never really asked, I guess. Like, I mean, obviously it was likely homo, but something I don't read or hear mentioned much is that the association of early hominins with tools is like non-existent. Like there's just no like association. I, we infer. I mean, it's a very good guess. But as far as I know, no paleoanthropologist has ever found like a complete set of hand bones clutching a tool in a million-year-old sediments or something. Like it's, I don't even know if they've even like been found on the same damn horizon. Like, oh, here's a skull of this or even a little hand bone or a little scrap of bone from a human. And over here is a little shell, you know, like a stone tool midden or something that we found. I mean, it's probably not lions or hyenas or naked mole rats. Uh, and you know, maybe it's a relative of chimpanzees, but their fossil record is really scant. Like some teeth of an ancestral chimp were excavated from like sediments younger than 540,000 years uh, old in Kenya. But that's like about it for chimps, you know, like, so it's like, okay, well, we don't even know much about their past. <clears throat> We're lucky enough to have what we have about ourselves. But, you know, comparatively, there's lots of fossils in Africa. It's not like it's paleontologically impoverished or whatever, comparatively, you know. Um, so it's it's a weird thing. And you just got to say, well, the likely culprit is ourselves because we can look at ourselves and go back and be like, well, we use a shit ton of tools now. Like, what, it likely is us, you know, our lineage anyway, our clade or whatever that are doing this stuff. Our monophyletic clade. I won't even get into it. Our what? No. <laughs> so, um, I got to talk about what some of these things, I don't know why I'm talking about, but I'm going to talk about it they like to talk about they give these na- these regions you know names throughout the planet in part i think because the researchers were isolated from each other at one point in time but also because there's no not until recently a global human technological complex or whatever um and so it's similar to i was talking last time about there's like ages and things like that in geological time well for instance there's the north american land mammal ages 
but there's also like European land mammal ages, you know, like, and, they, and they're not perfectly overlapping with each other. And it's a lot to do with, you know, maybe they're just the disparity or whatever diachrony of the timing of things happening throughout the, the world, you know? So when, when it comes to Africa and human evolution, but as well as, as it spills into, well, definitely Africa early, there's early middle and late stone age in sub-Saharan Africa. And that is roughly contemporaneous with lower, middle, and upper Paleolithic in Europe and Northern Africa. So there's this kind of, whenever I'm reading these things, I'm seeing a lot of, if it's a review paper that's trying to talk about a lot of stuff in Africa, the Middle East, and, you know, Northern Africa, of course, and then Europe, they're having to like do like a, you know, slash between the two different times. I don't know about the Stone Age in terms of timeline, but the it's roughly contemporaneous with the Paleolithic. That's the European Northern Africa thing. And so the lower Paleolithic is like 3.3 million to 300,000 years ago. The middle Paleolithic goes from 300,000 to 45,000 years ago. So Homo sapiens likely is only going to be coming into play in this second middle part of the paleolithic and then or middle stone age and then the upper is from like 45,000 to 10,000 years ago and then you get the mesolithic and the neolithic and there's various breakdowns and a lot happens in a short period of time as if things were expanding exponentially also they talk about modes like there's five modes um and i just want to kind of go through like the the first three, roughly. The first, the big one is the older one, and that's mode one. Um, and it's kind of what's been called like a least effort system, quote unquote. Uh, and basically, you, you make a sharp edge by whatever means you can, you know? And so it's like a hand, it, it, there's one particular style. It's a very hammer and anvil style called the bipolar percussion method. It's not the only one, I don't think, of course, because if it's any means you can. But it's sort of, you know, you make a, you take a small handheld sharp edge, you know, pieces that you make out of cracking a rock between two other rocks or something hard. And then that little small handheld sharp edge piece will cut through hide, cartilage, muscle, whatever. But it's really just like, bang, sharp edge, cut. You know, like it's, you know, that style. What do you hold on to if you make both poles sharp? You hold it in the middle? Well, you you, you tend not to. You just break one one side and it's just got a sharp edge and you just use that. But later on, they definitely had, in the next one, the Acheulean Mode 2, as they refined this style... Yeah, there's like some that are like completely round and are like super sharp looking around the whole thing. I'm like, what did you How do? do? They like, use it? Were yeah. people just were they just tough? And they're just like, like, you know, they're just using their hands all day, so they're just like super calloused, and it didn't matter if you shaved a little callus off each time you like made a cut with it or something. But it's kind of the inverse of the sort of bipolar percussion hammer and anvil style technique, because instead you use a hammer stone like you would probably to make any other. But you do it to make a bifacial sharp edge on the one side or on two sides of a, well, no, sorry, on one side of a large rock, but it's bifacial. So you want it to be kind of coming to a point, you know, yep. with the blade knife edge going. And but then on the other side, you'd have this handheld portion. So you could hold like something that was soft, softer to the touch. And this is known as the hand axe and it's a big deal. Uh, because it was really a big step. And it did become more refined over time. And then the third mode, apparently, is the Mysterian. Not the Mysterian, but the Mysterian. And it's not about moose. And it's like from a sharpened core, like, you know, uh, in a way like the Acheulean core, you uh, can retrieve flakes by breaking off the core pieces of rock. And so then these flakes then become, they can be made to serve various purposes and retouched and do, you know, they do more. And so it's just kind of like you have one thing where you just kind of break it and you're like, yeah, I got a sharp edge, any means necessary. And then the second thing is you're like, well, I got this big rock. I'm going to nip away at that, you know, and I'm going to hold it. 
I'm going to bash things with it. <clears throat> and then finally, they're like, what if I broke a thing off of that? Man, that's super sharp. And I can kind of screw around with it in fine detail and get something, you know, you know, oh, well, this piece was a little larger than that piece, so I'll use this larger piece for this other thing. So it's kind of, I think, as I understand the experimental archaeology view of these tools, you know, that's kind of the the first three modes. And they're kind of the big, the first two in particular are really important because the jump is uh, pretty big if you're just any means necessary to all of a sudden using the tool and a little, you know, making a tool with a little more intent. And that's the, that's the big one because kind of, you know, they've been able to take this old one mode and get chimpanzees to try and do it. They kind of do an okay job. I think the results are mixed, but you know, it's, it's okay. You know, it's not great. So anyway, so that's kind of the idea of these sort of tools. Fire. Let's talk about fire. Unless you have anything to say, but no, I'm we just, agreed you would say nothing. <laughs> I'm just finding it helpful Sorry. that they called the first one the older one. If only they would have called the other one the newer one, I'd be set. <laughs> oh my god, I hope that's been joked about by those people. If not, they take themselves way too seriously. Yeah, the older one. It's hilarious. I, and it's it's not for any... I mean, the origin is it's the Olduvai Gorge where they oh, found, yeah. I think. Mm-hmm. I know, right? There's also this place called Lamequi. And that's pushed this Olduan style back to 3.3 because otherwise it was around 2.6 million years ago is the oldest for Olduan. The old... <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> so the Lamequi in is like cruder somehow? I don't know. Anyway, so let's talk about fire. Yes, the newer one, the fire one. All right. So obviously with fire, humans could uh, likely be more active at night. The smoke could maybe keep insects at bay. I mean, it does when I go camping. And heat and the flickering flame may scare predators for both defensive and offensive reasons. Offensive, you know... Defensive, like when you're sleeping, but offensive, like if you're scavenging. Do they? And then do they just use it for heat? Well, no. <laughs> Idiots! They could also use it for eating. Yeah. But it served various purposes in general. And of course, yes, it, it, it would be good for eating. And so, yeah, there's these things that I guess I want to chitty chat about. Uh, one is, you know, just sort of, I want to talk a little bit about ideas that people, some people have about the origins of attempting to control fire um, and sort of how we get around to that. That's going to, there's going to be a lot of that in this episode where I'm not as focused on what happens once you got it. I'm more focused on how would you fucking get there? Like, I I love that shit. It's like, what are the little steps along the way that would, you know, allow this to start to happen uh, but then yes bigger, uh, bigger cooking the cooking hypothesis by Richard Rangham in particular and then there's also the fur loss thing like why, why don't we have any fur um, and so I'm kind of relating a lot of that stuff to fire in this particular way yeah, I'll, I'll give caveats along the way because there's a lot to cover and I don't know I'm like okay all right so, so they probably have acquaintance with fire. Or I'm, how prevalent is wild fire in this niche? Started by Good lightning question. or whatever, however it gets started. But they are, are they all going to know fire really well? And the leap is figuring out how to artificially and purposefully construct some? Or do they not even know fire? I think the idea is that they would know fire. Yeah. And that if that they would do exactly as you described, that they would like be familiar, and there's some ideas about how that can happen in some of our relatives that still live, our nearest or closest relatives, and um, then yeah, you got to find a way to like hold on to it or be able to generate it. <clears throat> so one suggestion then is that over time, 
members of our ancestral lineage began to use fire as a resource first indirectly through kind of like predictively navigating, foraging and stretching, and then directly through its creation and control, like we were talking about. And I say by control, you determine its behavior and what it does next. And I know that's we're talking about fire, but in a way, roughly, you can do things with it and sort of determine kind of how it's going to, how it's going to work or how you're going to, how you're going to hone it. It's power to your will or whatever. Will of power. So the idea of how our lineage, say, could come to control fire is that like other animals, humans initially took advantage of grass and woodland fires on the African savannas before they learned to stretch it, you know, like beyond the fire season. However, if we're going to do any of that, you probably got to have, you know, like we were saying, be comfortable with it. So this anthropologist Jill Pruitts and some of her colleagues have described sort of the fire behavior of chimpanzees at this study site in east, southeastern Senegal, which is in the west of Africa, not the east. But there's savannas, the way that it works. There's savannas uh, north of the jungles, if you will, and it goes all the way across, and it's south of the Sahara. So anyway, it's this study site called Fungoli. And in particular, Pruitt's and a colleague of hers by the last name of Leduc, they reported on how chimpanzees, quote... Calmly monitor bushfires at close range, like 10 meters. That's like my input. Um, and change their behavior in anticipation of the fire's movement. Furthermore, they interpreted the behavior as, quote, being predictive rather than responsive in that they showed no signals of, like, stress or fear. So then later, she and another colleague... Notice that when fire passes through an area, it clears dense vegetation and provides uninhibited views of the, at the ground level. And that this is good for spotting predators like leopards and lions who would who coincidentally, I don't know, maybe not, happen to avoid burned areas. And I suppose that's possible because they're like either afraid of fire and just being like, yeah, get out of here. Or, <clears throat> yeah, they rely on cover because they're stealth hunters or whatever. But the bigger claim out of this work is that these chimpanzees have a concept of fire. And she was talking about how male troop leaders may even do this kind of like little slow, quote-unquote, fire dance, the way they do a, quote-unquote, rain dance. What? Um, and they also, I know, and they also report <laughs> like unique vocalizations around bushfires. So that's some of the stuff the idea of habituating to the seasonal presence of fire, my thinking is then, how crazy is it then to then move to eating these dead, crispy animals burned in its wake? You know, that seems like, oh yeah, you're like, you know, navigating first. Just be like, okay, here comes the fire over here. Oh yeah, you know, like, because it's a seasonal thing. And if you're, if you're, you know, uh, you know, a habiline, a small little guy, you're not super fast. You're not an antelope. You can't just like, I'm out of here when you take off. And these chimpanzees aren't sprinters either, you know? And so you you might, based on just your own damn, like, inabilities physically, you know, end up having those who can figure out how to, like, stay calm or those who just naturally stay calm in the variation that exists, you know, start to make decisions about the fire being calm in that state, you know, that calm state, and then start to move around. And likely their progeny would live through the fire season better than those who were like, oh my God, and their skin's melting off their face. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> the fire dance, rain dance thing, I'm just throwing it out there because this is fun. So you, you mean this person is claiming that some of these proto-human-ish things had a correlation thought that their physical m manipulations with it, like contorting their bodies would bring about fires no not bring about i thought that's what Just the rain like, dance was it was making it rain 
No, I think it's just like, oh, it's raining and I'm going to do this little like thing. It's like a particular body movement behavior or whatever. I don't know anything about rain dances and chimpanzees, but I just thought it was funny because it's like. Yeah, that, I mean, it sounds interesting. <laughs> I, I always I always picture some big chimpanzee just doing like a slow shoulder thing like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so. But, you know, beyond that, though, obviously fire is dangerous. And in our collective psyches, you know, it, it like you and me and everything, I think it's like wolves or other big predators. For some reason, fire, as great as it and mesmerizing and all the things it does for us, it's also kind of, uh, you know, one of those nightmares, you know, when it gets out of control. Yep. Um. And it's sort of the idea that, you know, destroying homes or worse or whatever, ending the lives of loved ones, that one always is kind of, I always have it in the back of my mind, even when it seems well controlled to me. So I think the idea of trying to control it is a big motivating factor, I would think. Uh, yeah. And it may be enough to en engender tolerance to like second degree <laughs> burns or whatever or at least second degree third degree nightmares one thing i'm thinking is that anything enhancing survival and reproduction will bear out over time so another obviously is that cooked critters is tasty and you know uh the big one though is like how would they stretch fire you know how do you go from navigating to like actually being able to have fire when it's not the the fire season or whatever <clears throat> do they consider evolutionary aesthetics as a sort of part of evolutionary psychology or is it its own thing you know with the question of what came first the medical benefits or the taste benefits of eating these barbecued critters um right because it's not obvious right. it's arbitrary with that we happen to find cooked meat tasty other creatures might not you know they might prefer it raw whatever so you're just saying oh they think they're so that they're delicious to get these wildfire <laughs> cooked antelope but were they or was it like a necessity at first and then we evolved a taste for it like we evolved a taste for sugar yeah that's a good question yeah. i mean i would think that i i, I don't know that's obviously one thing, the only thing I guess I tend to think about is the idea that caramelization. I don't know of anyone who I, I mean, any mammal anyway that doesn't that that's not appealing to, um, because it's like sugars or whatever. It's like, you know, these things are signals to your brain that, you know, oh, you know, these are the things my cells need or whatever, you know, and so, it's kind of why every every you know lots of animals are all just going after sometimes the same ripe fruit or whatever because it is has extra sugar and flavor and all that kind of stuff and that's i thought maybe in some ways part of the appeal of it you know at least for the fact that you know the plants would grow them at all you know and so i would think that caramelization of fats in meat is definitely going to do that but also i wonder if cooked meat in particular would go easier on your digestion. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, but in general, you know what I mean? Like, well, right. And that process going through that process probably kills a fair number of potential parasites and. Yep, exactly. And so you're killing off parasites, but also you might feel better. Like, I don't know if that's possible. But, you know, if you ever, like, for instance, you know, as an experiment for those who don't, like myself, eat much of this, but just eat raw kale. Like, I, when I have raw kale, I, I need to go lay down because my stomach's like, Jesus Christ, you know, like trying to just like, what is this paper cardboard you've just like thrown down your gullet? And I would imagine that, you know, eating raw foods even if they're meat, still requires a good amount of extra work on your stomach's part. But anyway, so maybe there's some ad additional stuff there. I don't know. That's a good question. Is there evolutionary aesthetics? 
But with, with respect to like stretching fire, the ideas that, that people come up with, I just don't like them. <laughs> I I kind of like, I don't know. It's hard for me to really, like one popular idea is that it was like fire was stretched by like using, protecting and carrying long burning materials. I assume that stretching like fire means finding some wild fire, but then tending it somehow yep. and keeping it around and using. So you, at first we don't know yeah. how to make it from scratch, but we can find some and light our torches or whatever. And then that's, you call that stretching fire. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, the idea of like, you know, dung or <clears throat> logs and branches of fire resistant trees like eucalyptus or whatever, this <clears throat> are some of, these are some of the ideas that in particular Richard Rangham, I don't know if he threw them out on his own. Uh, well, the dung is this other guy, but I just like, well, maybe, <laughs> but like, I don't know. Too speculative uh, for Ryan McKenna. Well, what I'll say is this. The issue I have with fire foraging and stretching is that if fire is responsible for major changes in diet, which people make claims about, uh, and form and survival in terms of cooking and hair loss and all these other defense and stuff, it seems really precarious to make such a great evolutionary like to make such great evolutionary commitments to something so ephemeral you know if the cooking and alternative warmth hair loss hypotheses are correct for the evolution of say erectines so homo erectus you know i don't know might this be when humans started to actually really control fire otherwise it seems like uh, or less like a controlled use of fire, and more like con fire's controlled use of humans, or something. It's you know, there's without a consistent ability to make and control fire, these hypotheses to me seem much weaker. Um, and the thinking I had about it was like, there's these on the island of New Caledonia. There's these New Caledonian crows, and they have this flat bill design to their, you know, th th that they have for manipulating materials like sticks normally crows i've given you this example before i guess but they have like a more curved beak you know and it's you know good for doing other things like probably digging at critters on the road that are dead but the flat bill design allows these new caledonian crows to use sticks and suddenly like imagine as absurd as it seems like on this island there were no more sticks you know they're evolutionarily committed to a bill morphology for a specific tool making and tool using ability that is at least today a benefit more than a cost because it is consistently like affording them with the means of acquiring the resources they need to survive. Like a smoldering log or a smoldering piece of shit can still be accidentally extinguished. Then what? Like hope some nearby competing group will share some of their smoldering shit. Like, I don't get it. Like, maybe you just got to sneak up on them and kill them or whatever. And to me, this doesn't seem like an evolutionary stable strategy. You're just like, oh, crap. <laughs> now what are we going to do? We've lost all our hair. <laughs> We're just like, it just seems so, I don't know. But isn't I may that be another kind of thing that's relatively this, but... common that we're at the mercy of the environment or we follow nomadically around to find perhaps something like rain or I don't know. Yeah, but when, I mean, it's in season, but, you know, there's, when it's not fire season or rain season, no matter how far you go, the likelihood that you're going to find enough of whatever it is that you need, it's not, it's not like fire just like burns through Africa in a big circle, you know, and you just got to follow the fire. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's just, you know, seasons change. And so when it gets really, really dry, it doesn't take much to get fire going. I don't know. It just seems like it's a nice thing to have during certain times of the year, and at worst, utter fucking chaos if you're, like, depending on it. And there's a movie called Quest for Fire. There was a book, actually, called Quest for Fire and the movie adaptation. Uh, you know, and, like, it's like, that's the idea, you know, and it's, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I buy that whole stretching it bit. But... I don't know. Maybe we're giving our ancestors more reasonability than they deserve. You know, that they'd be like, oh, yeah, we'll just share. You know, I, just, I don't know.
I don't even want to give that to but, 2019 Republicans. <laughs> I know, totally. It's people today. I'd be like, I don't trust them. Man, I watch like YouTube's like Fury Road shit, and I'm like, my God, there's people. I don't even know what the reason was, but they're smacking each other, and they're just like commuting to work. And I'm like, yeah, okay, but you're gonna go and ask for some fire from somebody? You're like, I don't know. And also, there's other things that are related to like trespassing in you know groups that were studied you know, in a first contact kind of way and trespassing in a lot of these kind of more nomadic style groups, even though they're nomadic, they still are nomadic within a range. And if you're not part of their tribe, it's like penalty is death. You know, it's like, it's not like, uh, oh, it's all right. Whoever you are, we understand. And if you look at like chimpanzees that there's like on the edge, they'll have like roaming bands of, you know, chimps just looking for any loser who decided to walk too far away from their own group and then they'll kill them, you know? So I don't know. It just, I would think that those who could find a way to control fire would have a huge advantage over anyone else. And I don't know how you'd make it back then. Cause even it, it, there's doesn't seem to be a lot of manipulation of things like Flint and pyrite. And those are the best uh, spark making rocks apparently, and I, I and they don't even apparently do a really good job at it in and of itself. So it's weird. But this is the thing about the cooking hypothesis that you know you do go from habilines to erectines. You get bigger brains and bigger bodies. So like Hamo habilis was different than their Australopith ancestors. They're presumably Australopith ancestors in their head and brain size and hind leg anatomy, you know? And so what it kind of seems like is that it likely kind of maintained, they maintained their ability to climb trees as efficiently as apes, but also had the ability to walk relatively well on two legs. Uh, so there's sort of like a little uh, between, you know? Um, but there's quite a bit of change when you find. I wish we had kept that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Might come in handy. But there's a big change from habilines to erectines. So, like, the simplest version of the cooking hypothesis is that fire cooked food, cooked food provided erectine ancestors, our erectine ancestors, with more energy for cellular processes, which could be allocated into making bigger bodies and brains. While at the same time, reducing the relative size of teeth and guts. You know, if you look at a you know, chimpanzee or any of these animals, zebras. I was looking at a picture of a zebra, not a painted mule. And man, that thing had a huge gut. And I'm like, is it pregnant? And then you, I saw the schlong. <laughs> and I was like, nope. So it's, it's they just like animals that just eat in raw foods, especially, you know, mammals, they got these huge guts and they just got to really work at it, you know? So the changes from the members of the early, you know, earlier members of genus Homo, like the Habilines, to the Erectines seem fairly stark. Like from the Habilines to Erectines, brain and body size is kind of dramatically different. Like adult body size in early hominins like the Habilines is something like the height of my kid, my son. So, you know, 4'1", four, 4'2", four, whatever. And the Erectines uh, are like, could maybe even reach 6'1", six, six, whatever. There's this Turkana boy. Although, like I said earlier, people are like, that couldn't have been, you know, your estimate is wrong or whatever. But it's been estimated this Turkana boy that's been found is almost complete st specimen near Lake Turkana, um, which is one of the Rift Valley lakes. It's estimated that he could have grown to a height of 6'1", had he lived to adult. No wonder they got all the chicks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Peep, peep. But by volume, yeah. You could probably fit a Habilene brain into like a Starbucks venti cup, like it's 20 ounces or whatever. There might still be some like brains brimming over. Erectines had a brain you could like on average cram into one of those Nalgene bottles, which is like 32 fluid ounces or whatever. So there's 
that's the one thing about the you know the cooking hypothesis is that it it would allow for a lot more energy to go to the brain and to the body, and then it would also allow that you wouldn't have these these honking teeth, and you, you know you also wouldn't have to have this huge gut because it's in a way like pre digested, you know, but using fire instead of acids and stuff and bacteria. So then. In addition to all of that, cooking and stretching and, you know, navigating around fire, there's this issue of, like, fur loss. So uh, there are many hypotheses about fur loss. In a weird way, there's a ton of hypotheses about fur loss. Some of them have to do with, like, parasites, and others have to do with... Uh, temperature changes in the environment, I believe, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there is one that I think in terms of timing, you could say it makes kind of sense that it would be related to fire. So the loss of fur may have happened sometime around 1.2 million years ago. And this is according to calculations and genetic analysis of the, are you ready for this? Melanocortin-1 receptor gene locus. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this particular uh, gene locus makes the proteins responsible for skin and hair color. So this age estimate is based on assumptions and calculations of mutation rates, population sizes, and the relationships between genes. So essentially, there's numerous gene variants if you ever took genetics or evolutionary biology or something, you'd run across the word allele. So there's different alleles, and they play a role in producing the varying colors of hair and skin. Many variants are reported across the chimp-human divide and among non-human Africans, or non-African humans. <laughs> there's a lot of them non-human Africans out there. However... There is but one allele of this kind in African populations. Because chimps mostly live in forests and have fur covering their skin, protecting it, and because Eurasian populations are at high latitudes with less sun, and because other evolutionary processes have been ruled out, it's suggested that selection for skin color is relaxed in these two larger variation groups, and thus this particular gene variant in African populations may like co-vary strongly with darker skin which are selected for in order to cope with the sun's rays suggesting the loss of fur but if you have fur overheating in a open sun-bathed savanna is a problem like a lot of the predators hunt at night you know and even to an extent a lot of the herbivores seem like they're just sort of you know, they're active at night as well. Like they're, you know, they know they're getting going to get eaten or chomped at some point in, in the night, but they're, you know, it's, it's cooler, you know. And a lot of these savannas that, you know, you see on TV and stuff, they're in very, you know, near the equator. It's, it's hot there, you know. So without fur, you know, a greater, you know, physical effort, though, can be made over a longer duration in the daytime. We also sweat, and that has the evaporative cooling effects um, that, uh, you know, are harder to dissipate when you have fur. So this guy, Richard Rangham, this anthropologist, you know, he notes how chimpanzees performing a charging display are like visibly sweaty and breathing heavily afterward. And being furless, you know, just, you know, you could probably exert a little more effort potentially. Also, predators would be less active. So there's this whole, also this whole chubby baby thing. I think human babies are have a you know they have a thick layer of fur or I mean fat under their skin that I don't think other primates have. They don't. They're just sort of you know if you look at a baby chimp, they're just sort of skin and bones. Um, and perhaps this is a better way, you know, than being furry at birth if one has a furry baby around a campfire, you know which could be a potentially lethal problem concerning first flammability. And if reproduction is such a big fucking deal, 
you know, then, you know, that seems to be a, di- a an idea. And also, I don't remember what it's called, but we do in utero or whatever are covered in this kind of fur at one point and then it dissolves or whatever. But some kids today, humans, are born with that fur intact and it just falls away. I don't know when, but it's not long after. But it's a fur coat, you know. And that's just something. It's just the variation in the timing of development, and it just, for whatever reason, stuck around, and then it goes away later. Uh, so there's that. So it's not like it's, you know, it is kind of funny. You know, babies being born, you want them to survive. They need to be kind of incubated after. And so we have this rich milk that we give the babies, and then they get real plump real quick. Uh, their body, you know, and it, so it's kind of, there's some good stuff going on there. So there's that's fire. So we're talking about human evolution, people. All right. Any um, callbacks, complaints? I've passed up a bunch of puns, but I'm going to continue to do that. (laughs) Or we'd never get anywhere. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, I have so much to talk about. But puns, please just... you. There's always time, huh? More than welcome. Always time for puns. I think. I hope. Jesus. Anyway. (laughs) Um, we'll do a lightning round Holocene Anthropocene at the end, but you know, this is the stuff, this to me is the stuff that like we're talking about when it comes to Pleistocene and human evolution. These things seem really tangible to me. Like they may not be perfect and they may not be totally, uh, stable over time, you know, provisional or whatever. But these are to me like the kind of attempts that strike me as good thinking and, and um, fruitful avenues, you know, to try and work out, at least scientifically, you know, to, you know, because uh, that, that's kind of important. So, language and tools. So, there's this whole area of language origins about how tools are the basis upon which language got going. Or not tools, but tool making. And I'm not even sure necessarily always where to begin. This was a part that I was kind of like, yeah, I don't know. But they require, language and tool making require very similar things on the one hand, like working memory, um, which one could define as uh, this guy Nelson Cowan defines as memory as it is used to plan and carry out behavior. Apparently, this one guy, whose last uh, first name I can't remember, uh, is Ambrose is his last name, he notes that like cognitively oriented researchers don't suggest planning as part of the definition of working memory per se, but it's more like comprising a function with nested subfunctions, wherein a subfunction is completed before another can be fulfilled. If you've ever programmed and you've ever used, you know, uh, like for me, it's usually calculating using equations or whatever. But you use like, you know, if it's sort of a C-based programming language or whatever, you got for loops and do loops and you kind of maybe some in if-then-else statements in there. Um, you kind of have things run through once, you know, one set and then you move on to the next one before you finally can get back to the to the top again and start the process over again. Sort of that kind of idea with working memory. This guy Cowan goes on to say, uh, quote, one relies on working memory to retain the partial results while solving an arithmetic problem without paper, to combine the premises in a lengthy rhetorical argument, or to bake a cake without making an unfortunate mistake of adding the same ingredient twice, end quote. So at least for Acheulean tools that I was talking about earlier and the tools made, you know, tool making industries or whatever that came after, one needs to kind of keep their thoughts on multiple goals. Um, You know, the primary goal, of course, being making a completed and useful tool like a hand axe. But there are all these other ones, you know, like a secondary goal could just be like, I don't know, creating a bifacial edge. This is a sort of separate thing, you know, and it has to have the appropriate... You have to have the appropriate angle and power when striking the core stone with your hammer stone. Otherwise, you fuck it up, you know? And it's not a least effort thing. It's not where you're just like, oh, yeah, I'll just, you know, crack it and sharp edge and cut, you know? Like, 
it's more uh, there's more work involved when experimental archaeologists try and recreate a lot of these kinds of tools, and it takes them a long time. So there's there are apparently experts out there who do this stuff. But also there's the overlap, the sensory motor circuits between the hand uh, and speech production and to an ex well, speech production. Human language and stone tool making kind of rely on highly similar patterns and processes of hierarchical design and development. And so moreover, there's much overlap in the sensory areas in the brain that these processes are housed in. And in part, I'm going to say, because physical evidence for symbolic thought comes much later than stone tools in the record, the stratigraphic record or whatever, I think it's, you know, it is thought that language piggybacked on tool making in a pedagogical sense. So that utterances correlated with actions in teaching may have begun to form semantic relationships and then using this quote unquote action grammar of the tool making quote unquote scaffold in the tool making process creates phrases, etc. You know, those things begin to form. But this is not at all like set in stone. There's that pun again. It's just an area of research that right now is still ongoing and is interesting to me. Um, and I think it kind of, you know, makes sense because I could see where, I mean, for instance, we already have a good record of organisms using utterances that seem different from one another, but are always closely related to like, you know, uh, other things in their world, like snake or bird of prey or leopard, you know, so to think that humans weren't capable of doing that. And then if, you know, organisms that use tools where it's highly important for their world to be making tools. And since we find them enough that it seems like it's definitely an important thing to whoever was making them, that you'd have to inherit that technology and that capacity. And so the better able one is to get the idea across, the better the whoever's receiving that information will be able to, you know, improve themselves in the process. And I kind of think of it as also like, you know, when you got all those grizzly bears around the the stream with the salmon coming through, there's mothers trying to get their kids to learn, you know, okay, here's this seasonal resource. This is how you catch, you know, and some of these bears aren't really good at catching and some are. And so those that are likely do better in general, unless they're good at stealing, which is another thing entirely. But you know, like you got to learn how to figure it out. You kind of see there's some sort of imitation, but there's also kind of emulation or just like the basic idea of catching a fish as it's sort of swimming by or whatever. And I think that doesn't seem like crazy to me that people would be doing that, you know, Homo erectus or whatever back in the Pleistocene, you know, going, Ugh, or Gabuh, or whatever the fuck to get their kid to like, you know, Hey, you know, and who, you know, the other thing I could say is all parents yell at their children. So that just makes sense. <laughs> hey, shit hat, you got to hit it like this. I don't want to. Anyway, so there's some of that. What's your pun for that one? Uh, I don't know. Hit your kids, everybody. Is that what you said? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Hit your kids. That's just advice. Not really a pun, but you know. <laughs> All right. We've 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 got physical abuse and rape already in this. I don't know. We could hit another one at some point later, but let's save it. So, okay. So that's, those are some big ones in my thinking when it comes to the Pleistocene. These are huge. Eventually, you know, we definitely improved on our ability to make tools. There's the control of fire that eventually occurred in, you know, with humans. And that, that it's hard to say right now exactly when that absolutely occurred. It could have been 500,000 years ago. I, I'm not exactly certain. And I don't think anyone else is. Um, and then there's the possibility of that tool making, which is something that likely would have been, 
very uh, important part of the everyday life of our hominin ancestors, our human ancestors, that that may have played a role as well in the generation or the origins of, of language. Okay. But another key thing that happens during the Pleistocene when it comes to humans is all this migration. Sapiens definitely migrated. <laughs> Erectus migrated. And Neanderthals migrated. If you think Heidelbergensis is an actual thing, they migrated. You know, so there's a lot of... And what, whoever was the uh, ancestor to Homo floresiensis, which is in Southeast Asia, in the islands there, they, they're the product of migration. And this is, of course, because... The single origin one, you know, we all come from Africa. So compared to sapiens who traversed from Africa to South America in like 120 to 100,000 years, however, erectines took perhaps like 380,000 years to go from Africa to Southeast Asia. Some think erectines were avoiding predators for a while in their migration routes until perhaps they entered areas with fewer large predators as they were passively following prey migrations. And then that later, the rectines were more strongly correlated with the presence of possible flint sources. But again, I don't know of the association with flint until I think later. So I don't know if back a million years ago or whatever, or more, I'm saying like 1.6 million years ago, that erectines in the area we call today India would have been, you know, as they're migrating through, would have been like, oh, this is good. We got flint, guys. You know, I, I, just, I don't know if that's what they were doing. Anyway, another possibility, though, in my thinking, is that erectines passively following large herbivores as scavengers during interglacial periods but that as glaciations advanced, uh, they stopped with the food sources since, like I mentioned last time, the mid-latitude ecosystems became more mixed because you have the tropics in the you know south and you've got these the advance of the ice sheets to the north and so it kind of squished everything together and made, Remember the squirrel nut zippers in Toronto and the squirrel nut zippers in Mexico City come together and hang out in North Carolina. So all over the world, likely that's kind of happening. You have all this, you know, changes because of the precipitation and the temperature and all those kinds of conditions causing plants to move. And of course, soils are going to change. Things are going to be at uh, one time a forest, now a tundra, and so on and so forth. And so during these condensed periods, and I don't have any evidence for this, but I think you could probably try and test this, you know, I would think that there's less migration. And then when the glaciers melt and you're going into an interglacial, there's all this expansion going on as organisms, you know, move into areas that were once covered in ice or because of the conditions of temperature and precipitation, are able to form, uh, plant their seed and get enough what they need in places they weren't able to before. So, you know, you get all this migration of plants and animals and, you know, large herbivores move and the erectines go as well. And so this is an idea that is caught by this paleontologist, Elizabeth Verba. It's called the traffic light model. It's this idea. It's like, you know, it's green light and you go and then it's, you know, red light, you stop, you hang out, and then green light, you go. It's that kind of a thing. And sort of, you know, that might be the reason. If they're just passively following large herbivores, erectines, it takes them forever to get around. For the sake of comparison, the Pleistocene was also a time when lions, not mountain lions, but lions dispersed from at least some point in Asia um, to Peru, you know. But they also were in Europe and Asia and Africa, they went all over the place. So, But it took them like 300,000 years to go from Asia to Peru. So it's, you know, they're probably passively following their resources as well. So my thinking is that to migrate so far and wide over a much shorter duration than erectines and lions, 
I have to wonder if it came down to having language on top of and likely facilitating all the other tools sapiens inherited, you know, because the sapiens traversed across the planet. And I've talked to you about this before. The planet was like heading into and out of a glacial period. So what this means is for a moment, if you will, consider a visualization. So imagine flying in a plane at cruising altitude over a full horizon of clouds. Consider that as the plane moves in one direction, the clouds are moving in the opposite direction, so that the sum of the velocities offers you an apparent view of moving faster. Consider the perspective of flying perpendicular to the clouds as well, and how this might appear. So keep this in mind. So thinking of this cruising altitude visualization and the apparent increase in velocity, the dispersal rate of sapiens out of Africa increased because they were moving northwest, east, and environments were moving south. So like they likely would have encountered harsher conditions geographically as they crossed into northern latitudes, but also temporally as the climate changed into a glacial period. Thus, the expansion of sapiens, in spite of the onset of harsher environmental conditions, is kind of paradoxical because like we're saying you know if anything they should have just decreased in population size or retracted their range just as their actines possibly had before them you know as they followed the herds or whatever but they didn't they just kept going and today of course we witness habitat tracking on a large scale due to global warming as numerous species are of a typically more southerly range are increasingly observed and reported further north and so the idea is that, you know, organisms uncouple themselves from tracking their habitat during major environmental changes, either through the evolution of novel traits or by chancing upon refugia. Um, and we see this with like many threatened populations that exist in habitats that behave as quote unquote islands in a sea of inhospitable habitat. So you can think of the basin and range in Nevada with the mountaintops have all these animals that in the past would have likely been able to be connected because the basins were, there were lakes and lots of, you know, uh, vegetation relationships going on. They weren't these shrub scrubby deserts that they are today, but now the animals have to be up in the mountaintops because that's where they can, the, the right conditions are for their resources, etc. enough rain, enough cover from vegetation or whatever. And uh, maybe, a good enough range of temperatures that they require. So two real quick examples of this. You've got in my area of the world, you've got in the Columbia River Gorge, these pikas. They normally, pikas live in really high altitudes. It's super fucking cold and their physiology is adapted to living in these environments. They dart in between the rock crevices and little talus fans and things like that. And birds of prey try and get them and whatever. Um, and they eat like precious flowers and things like that. But there's this population down in the gorge, which is much lower in elevation. And um, it's wet throughout much of the year. It gets its cold days and snow. It's pretty windy because of the, the gorge, the way it's channeling winds and stuff. But still, and also the Arctic air meets the Pacific. And Anyway. But these <laughs> poor pikas have to dart in between these moss-covered rocks, and they have a way to deal with the problem, and that is that they they eat paper, basically, by eating the moss. And they find ways to stay cool, I guess, in the rock crevices. But Are these things like just little rodents? Yeah, or just or like little rabbits. Know. They're just these like little... Okay. They're not rabbits. rabbits, but they're related to rabbits. Good question. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so you have these guys... And in order to get more nutrients, they have this, they shit and eat it. And they, it's a particular kind of shit. They have like two types of poop. But this is a way for them to have some kind of novel way of dealing with climate change because they live on the top of these mountains. And as climate continues to change, their habitat goes up and up and up. And then eventually the mountaintops, it's done, you know? And so you can't get any higher. So the, their range is retracted, just like with the polar bears in the north, you know, the climate is changing. The north is changing just in the similar kind of space, you know, spatial substitution kind of thing. You're going up in elevation or up in latitude. So there's that. And then another thing is that there's this frog down in 
South Central Oregon. And it's this really marshy area. And it's marshy because the Mount Mazama erupted and it's Crater Lake now. But all this ash and volcanic material filled in these valleys. And this frog, even though the world continued to change and there's, you know, changes in, in uh, you know, migration and, and the where, you know, the home range of these, its ancestral frogs are, uh, which is up north in Canada or whatever, they have all the right conditions to live in this one spot, but they can't spread out from it. In this one spot, the thing about the sediments or the volcanic materials is that they're allowing there to be standing water and kind of marshy, swampy kind of conditions that literally, if you just leave it, you know, going, you know, uh, east or south or whatever, it's just like desert, high desert scrub. And so you can have these little refugia sometimes, but we don't do that. Like we just went, well, fuck it. We're just going to go north, you know, yeah, the world's changing. I don't care. You know, like, and it's crazy to me because it's like, okay, well, what allows us to do that? You know, and my thinking is that it's just our special way of communicating with each other, which I think would allow us to quickly make the kind of adjustments that you'd need, you know, and all these novel situations, animals you'd never seen before, or, you know, how do you, you know, how do you deal with this hide? This is weird. It's thicker than normal. And, oh, well, I got to, yeah, I made the bone a needle stronger or a bigger one or whatever. You know what I mean? Like Homo erectus, they used Acheulean tools from like 2 million years to apparently they may have even lasted all the way to 50,000 years ago. They used Acheulean tools, period. Like that's all they did. And they followed the herds or whatever it was. Whereas our technology just keeps changing, you know? And I'm guessing the idea that you'd have stone tool making and language coupled together, I mean, one has to wonder if those two things are co-evolving uh, or had some co- co-evolutionary aspects at one point and language just helps us come up with the solutions and they tend to be, you know, at the moment anyway, materially based uh, for our problems and, you know, whatever. Uh, so there's all that. So going against the grain is what we did. And I think the grace was language. I don't know what else it could be, especially when you compare it again to other human lineages. Anyway, so there's that. Puns? Uh, What's a pun? Mm. Excellent. Language doesn't pun with much. It's a pretty distinctive noise. All right. So are you ready to talk about the megafaunal mass extinctions? Fuck yeah, that sounds exciting. <laughs> Actually, I'm the least amount of prepared for this one because I'm cocky at this point. Ooh, nice. In the outline. <laughs> <clears throat> so I talked about all those big mammals and I was all like... Around and blah blah blah, but the one thing in addition to our migration is that the further away you get from Africa, the more you know rapid the extinctions were when humans arrive on the scene, more or less. So, and the numerous, the more numerous the extinctions were. So, as humans go from you know Africa, Africa, there were some extinctions. Uh, but not uh, nearly as as many. And in Europe and Asia, there was extinctions, but not nearly as many. But the further uh, east you go in Asia, the more the extinctions are rapid. And then finally, you get in, in uh, North America and South America, which, by the way, when humans dispersed through those areas, going from north to south, climate was changing into an interglacial. So, like things were changing as well so they would have been like you know it would have been that acceleration thing again or that you know that dual velocity parents dual velocity experience anyway the extinctions were just you know more rapid and more complete of the megafaunal mass extinction so 
or the megafauna. And this kind of, again, it's, you know, sometime in a hundred and hundred thousand years ago, whatever it was. And then, you know, by the time humans are in, you know, Europe and Asia, you're getting around the 50,000 year mark. And then by the time humans are, and they're also in um, Australia by then, and then they get to Beringia, the land bridge between Siberia and Alaska. They're in that general area, on, say maybe 15, 20 to 15,000 years ago, sometime near or just after the height of the glacial period. And then finally, they just really rapidly go down probably, you know, the next three to 4,000 years right through the Americas and, you know, populating as they go and, well, maybe causing extinctions. I kind of think they definitely had a big hand in it. There are those, though, that kind of, in terms of causes, there are still some old-timers that have, like, resisted quite strongly. But uh, I'll kind of do a quick rundown. An honorable mention, there was, for a while, and I haven't heard anything since, but this idea that somehow diseases were to blame. We talked about in time travel, I had this take, and I was just like, you know, if you go back far enough or if you go forward far enough, you could get into trouble because of the evolution of the, you know, our our our, our germs, you know. Uh, could be going on and you know you might die soon after or cause a lot of death if you went back you know or you might die if you go into the future far enough and i think to some extent there is a little bit of that the idea that if you run into people who like lost the amazonian tribes or whatever people that are living quite isolated from the world in a way you know you don't want them grabbing your blankets or whatever because you could just you know, you're fine coughing in your blanket or whatever and not getting too bad of a cold, but they'll die. You know, it's like that kind of thing. So I think to an extent that was at one point, you know, as humans spread, maybe they were just spreading disease, <laughs> but these diseases would have to somehow be, you know, contaminating across lineages, I guess. Um, but I'm not exactly certain. I just know disease was one of them uh, and I knew it better back in the day. Uh, impact, that's always been a thing for all extinctions, it seems like. People are like, well, that's an impact. And there's been some recent excitement. There's like a crater in Greenland. But I don't know if it's been age-dated very well. So it's possible. But there's also the problem, apparently, with the dynamics of having some kind of bolide impact a shit ton of ice, like there would be in Greenland or Antarctica or the ice sheets in North America, that there's the ice, even though, sure, things would melt, it wouldn't. I don't think the physics works out that the bolide would just shoot right straight down and cause all these explosions, just like in uh, the KT mass extinction of the dinosaurs with the impact that happened that we described in the Megadeth uh, episode. So it, it, hard to say about that. That one's certainly not... I mean, maybe one day that some more stuff will come about and people will be like, oh, yeah. And then there's the uh, there are big proponents of climate as being a cause for extinction my biggest thing always was like well why didn't they go extinct in the other glacial interglacial transitions and you know they didn't you know so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense um but they're suddenly they just succumbed and of course it coincidentally succumbing as humans go around. <laughs> it's just like okay uh humans finally at this point are you know you know sapiens in particular are in the you know predator guild or whatever you know they're we're full-on predators you better run kind of thing if you're a hoofed mammal of some sort and we may have even been pretty good at taking down adults whereas most of the time other predators are going after the sick the old and the young you know we might have been able to do whatever so this is the overkill hypothesis that probably to an extent, not that humans had this major bloodlust, maybe they did, but there is this idea that if you go up to animals that are living on islands, they have lost maybe all of their, you know, maybe there aren't very many predators or whatever, and so they've lost this fear. And so, you know, there's, you know, the idea that, you know, Darwin talks about, like, in the Falkland Islands on his quest, he talks about just being able to, like, kill, knock a, this Falkland Island fox, lineage that he encountered 
he was talking about to just walk up to him and he'd just bang it on the head with a club and, you know, die and he'd skin it and, you know, have it as a, you know, example of whatever he found along the way. So maybe to an extent, at least as you get, for, as humans go into areas they'd never really been before, there is that sort of, I don't know, who, what's this? Oh, I'm dead, you know, and maybe there's to some extent that island effect of sorts on the lack of fear. But then in Europe, you, you know, certainly humans have been uncovered in those areas and had been living there for quite a while before sapiens came around, which eventually they did and interacted slightly with Neanderthals and Denisovans when they went to Asia. And, you know, so there's, you know, maybe some, they're acclimated, the prey items are more acclimated, but humans are just still very efficient. I also have often thought, like, what about overburden rather than overkill? Like, in these new environments, you suddenly have an additional predator. So it's like, remember, I was talking about North America. You already have, like, giant short-faced bears, lions, saber-toothed cats, uh, scimitar-toothed cats, mountain lions, wolves, you know, dire wolves, gray wolves, like black bears, like it just keeps going, you know, and now you have humans who are super efficient and maybe that top downness suddenly was just too much of a burden on these ecosystems. And while we were doing just fine, these prey and predator populations did ter terribly. There are those who think, well, it was both. There's a one, two punch, you know, climate was changing and humans were coming on. And it seems to be the most, most evidence supports that or whatever. But I also just think uh, it's the kind of like you can run, but you can't hide and you can't run forever kind of scenario where you, it's like uh, humans are dispersing all over the fucking place. Even if you found refugia, we're going to find you and be like, hello. <laughs> and that also seems to have occurred in the you know later periods where, you know, there's like, you know, we still find, at least with respect to the geologic or the fossil record, you know, like Irish elk in the Ural Mountains in Western Siberia living up to like 7,500 years ago. And we probably just were like, oh, there you are, <laughs> you know, like, Gil. you know, like it just seems to me like there's, you just, it, it, there's no way to get away from humans when we can do whatever we want at this point. And if that's the case, which is definitely, you know, compared to the other lineages that I've mentioned, even including, say, like lions, as predators, being able to move as freely as one seems like they just wanted. I mean, literally, it's it almost seems like we moved as fast as our feet could take us. That's sort of the ma megafaunal mass extinctions. It happened at the end. You know, well, I mean, it's staggered and it pretty much follows the, the timeline that I gave for human migration. <laughs> You know, by around twelve to 10,000 years ago, most of the large mammals are gone in North America that are the megafauna. And you only have this vestige. It's an intense number of species, too. And a lot of them had this co-evolutionary relationship with things, potentially, like avocados and their big seed as a relationship with, you know, uh, gomphotheres and gi giant ground sloths. Anyway... It's too bad, but it's it's over, and we only have essentially what's left is you know Africa. So, um, yeah. So that's that. What do you mean it's over? <laughs> Isn't that kind of thing still happening? Where we're making a bunch of other shit go extinct? Yeah, but like, I don't want to say it like this, but I guess I'm going to. We just didn't like. We just. I think we went, talk about evolutionary aesthetics. I think we might have gone after the ones that we were like, that one's pretty cool. You know, like, you see a lion and we're like, so drab. You know, <laughs> you know like, some of these animals were amazing looking, you know? And, uh, you know, from, even just from the reconstructions, you know, from what fossil material we do have. I don't know, I don't, maybe not. But, um, yeah, I, I, it's possible. Uh, you know, we, we are still causing extinctions and stuff, of course. Yes. But I was going to get to that. <sighs> so you ready for Holocene, Anthropocene lightning rounds? Lightning. Okay. I was going to say, unless this becomes a three-parter. I know. It's a lightning round. You ready? 
Yeah. Boom. The Holocene. A point of no return. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Holocene is the beginnings of the interglacial. And this latest interglacial that we are in sort of now, yes. But then there's this weird period uh, called the Younger Dryas, or if you really want to get specific, you might call it Heinrich Event Zero. Um, <laughs> and it's from like 13,000 to 12,000 years ago, and it's a weird kind of feedback that potentially occurred where um, all of a sudden the glaciers advanced back to like practically the point they were. So like suddenly for about a thousand years, everything just was like, bang, you know, like it got super cold again. And it looked like things were getting on that warming trend, and it kind of went back. And one of the cool things about that is that it might have been just a <clears throat> the melting of the glaciers themselves that had this impact on the ocean circulation, which shut down the thermal hailing current, potentially, maybe, and then caused the warm uh, distribu war di distribution of warm, uh, moist air throughout the warming world to stop and then the glaciers just kicked back into gear but then it just got you know killed off again and heinrich events are apparently events where you have a lot of drop stones i think that's what it is where you have just suddenly this like uh, a layer of uh the stratigraphic seafloor or whatever uh, the seafloor layer with stratigraphic layer has got a lot of material that would have been dropped from melting icebergs so one of the ideas is that people at one time thought, oh, well, maybe it was through the St. Lawrence River and the, you know, the, the kind of the spilling out into the Atlantic or whatever, because it would have shut it down from that point. But it doesn't look like there's any actual evidence for any kind of um, drop stones or whatever. But there is some evidence potentially up in the, in the Arctic Ocean where there are all these underwater uh, landslides, turbidites. I think is what they're called, the the deposits. And that may be a result of a lot of material, sedimentary material being flushed out at like some major crash in uh, maybe one of the ice sheet plates in the Arctic Ocean. And then a lot of fresh water gets lost really quickly and that shuts down. I don't know. There's that. Then also in the interglacial, you have the hypsothermal, which is this Holocene climatic optimum, peak warmth. 6,000 years ago, so we aren't even as warm as we were, <clears throat> um, although we're trying hard to get back. Agriculture. Did it begin, this is sort of like the single origin, multiple origins of humans. This is like, did it begin in one place and spread, or did it arise independently in different locations and spread? I think it, it actually, the f latest research is that it's multiple, that uh, agriculture kind of started in multiple places, but that originally it started, you know, first in like the Crescent Valley, the Western, a Western Asia near, you know, Middle East, et cetera. But this would lead to an increased sedentary nature of existence, reliance on small number of foodstuffs items and increase the variety of technological innovations, which is cool. And this I got from the Comparative Pathways to Agriculture Project at the University of College London. <laughs> Lightning round. Domestication. <clears throat> Shit. Domestication. I got to read stuff. Got this book called Self-Made Man by Jonathan Kingdon. So the idea is maybe perhaps weeding helped reduce competition for preferred plants. So here's some speculation for you, but it's based on studies of... I guess you could say hunter-gatherers today or in the modern world. For one thing, there's like religious sanctioning around harvesting early and things like that around, you know, crops or whatever it is. Um, but these are still not necessarily considered farmers. So this guy is integrating modern hunter-gatherers with other kind of archaeobotanical evidence. And he uses, yields the speculation that Quote, food plants that regenerate in middens or find fertile and sunny seedbeds on the margins of campsite clearings or in latrines expose the details of their life cycles to human inspection. They invite an awareness of dependency. They are not encountered. They are known in familiar detail, and it is possible that where campsites were regarded as being quote-unquote owned by a particular group, the edible plant growth around it was also regarded as being owned. Many nomadic people regard waterholes and campsites as property 
and the spacing out of nomadic bands would also have depended upon exclusive or priority use of key resources in the heart of their annual home range. These resources could have included many more plants than a few homegrown yams. For observant humans, the rapid growth of yam vines from the leftovers of their tubers would have been a near-instant demonstration of the beneficial consequences of messy dining. Now view the situation from the plant's point of view. For them, usurpation of the role of top seed disperser by humans generally narrowed the range of potential beds their seeds might fall in. Those plant species that could still propagate in spite of or because of peculiar human behavior would benefit the most. Among these assets um, would have been fewer seed predators around an encampment. It has been suggested that mainlanders in Southeast Asia were more involved in opening up forests than their island-dwelling neighbors. The clearing of significant areas implies high concentrations of people, and this in turn requires exceptionally rich food sources. When residence in a small area is fairly continuous, the use of wood for cooking fires alone eventually begins to consume the ever-widening circle of woody vegetation. Among the profusion of plants that spring up in clearings are many that are useful, but which ones prospered must have been more than a matter of chance. Prehistoric people would have been well aware of competition between plants and can be surmised to have intervened on behalf of useful plants when these were being outcompeted by quote-unquote weeds. Indeed, weeding may have been one of the early steps on the path to true horticulture. So there's that. You're welcome. <clears throat> Makes sense. Yeah, I like it. So then, well, what about, okay, so you start to develop these, or you already have these nomadic groups, and they already kind of have the sense of property. And now they're starting to notice things potentially about the world around them because they see things enough. In terms of the plants, they have some preferences for plants because that's their fucking life. And um, they're starting to select, artificial selection, the beginnings, domestication. So maybe after a while, they get really good at it and they start to spread things. They're burning more wood. They're maybe supporting themselves. Maybe they're getting a little bit more reproductively healthy, whatever. They start to get dependent on this food source, right? So one thing about agriculture is that once dependence occurs, people can future fuck, right? Because they can worry about the crop yield and the seasonal variability and be like, ah, shit, you know, it's a bad year, you know, whatever. Like, you know, over time, I could see this kind of happening. And this I'm pulling from that Yuval Noah Harari in his book, Sapiens. So you've got this worrying. So security of food is a good thing. Now that people are not free to roam, but farms can feed a number of people, and there can be leaders and followers and communities centered on the agriculture. And if they're bound by mountains, ocean, or other less arable land, the farmers can be embattled during bad years, or the groups with the leaders and all that kind of stuff. Once warfare begins, the winners and lo losers of these chiefdoms are united into a state if they can't escape, if they can't get away. And this is this idea by anthropologist Robert Canero um, called circumscription theory. And it's supported by some relatively recent modeling by people that I like, and that's kind of how I came about it. So I'm kind of connecting a whole bunch of different people's stuff right here. But that's sort of possibly going on. And, um, you know, you're fragmenting the world and stuff, and so you have ongoing animal extinction. You know, like I said, they found the Irish elk in the Ural Mountains. We're like, hey, hey, hey there you are. But also, whenever we go anywhere, moa, dodo, passenger pigeon, there's a lot of local extinctions, also known as extirpations. Like, you know, well, the wolves used to be here, but they're not, you know, now or whatever. All right, lightning round Anthropocene. Yeah, there's probably no going back. So erosion. the We've lowered the land surface by like six centimeters through agriculture alone. Globalization. With exponential population growth and economic political mergers, singular human demand on the planet's resources increasingly focused and intense, first on the poor and marginalized, and then up the ladder throughout society. Global warming, taking carbon out of the sto long-term storage and putting it in the cycle, increasing greenhouse effects. More extinction. Relative mass extinction is considered to be ongoing with the loss of different lineages all the time. Oh, my God. What? <sighs> no. What's happening? <laughs> 
that was the lightning round. I knew I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta hit this thing. So there you go, people. <laughs> Play it back in slow motion. Yeah. Just change the pitch. Um, yeah. So there you go. We've, Oh, and then the other thing is um, niche construction. Your favorite. I know. You do something. It's not just my favorite. There's a lot of a lot of cool people out there, Harlan, that like this um, <laughs> idea. Uh, but, yeah, niche construction. You fuck something up, it hurts you back, but you're not going to get rid of the thing that caused the thing to get fucked up anyway because it still helps. So you got to change and adjust and adapt to that. And then so on and so forth. It sure looks like humans do that quite a bit. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Anyway, thanks for listening. Uh, you got it all out, huh? I think I got stuff out. I have not been looking at the clock because I've been talking. Oh, not bad. Okay. The lightning round. I, that was a good idea. <laughs> That was a real good idea. I'm glad. That's fun, because then no one can be like, yes, but. And I'm like, no, no time. Move from agriculture to domestication now and civilization. Oh. You got the entirety of part three into three minutes. <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, we could maybe, I could revisit the Holocene and the Anthropocene. The Holocene, for sure. I mean, with the agriculture and stuff. Eh, but why bother? I <laughs> clearly totally covered it. Ah. <laughs> uh. All right. Well, if you have any puns, sad puns, let's do a sad pun. Like one where it's like, oh my God. Well, that was a good information dump. <laughs> it's kind of a pun. It is. Tune in next time, folks. Um, Dodler's Philosophy Morning Talk Radio. The Idiot's Delight. 